Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well today. It is a nice, cold, cold morning in Lexington, Kentucky, November 28, 2023. It was sort of wet and gray for a couple days. <clears throat> Super nice and clean and clear and sunny today, but it got cold. So, um, you know, winter is here. I think it was 24, 25 this morning when I got up. Thanks for coming. It's an early day for us, 9 o'clock. We'll see how it goes today. The um, Usually I do this at 10 a.m., as you all know, and today I'm doing it at 9 a.m. We'll do a sort of an in, a, a, a informal experiment to see if more people show up at 9 a.m. than 10 a.m. I have an appointment at, uh, this morning that I have to leave for, so I decided to do it at 9 a.m. today. There's still already some people here, so Lush and Brady and Jeremy, Randy, thank you all for coming. <clears throat> I appreciate it. I'm going to jump right into it today. Somebody about uh, four or five episodes ago, I don't even remember when, but there was a question. I don't even remember if it was on the channel. Maybe it was on Discord. I can't remember, but they asked about, is there any? are there any publications about batch control for home lawns, or maybe it was airification for home lawns. I don't really remember the exact question, but most of the stuff we've been going over, well, some of it has been for home lawns, but most of it has been for, well, a lot of it has been for golf or for sport turf or something like that. It hasn't really been a home lawn. Well, I mean, there has been. So, I mean, this is just another home lawn paper. That's where I'm going with this. So today I wanted to, um, go over a paper that specifically maintained it as a home lawn. Yesterday's paper was the <clears throat> influence on thatch production on a newly seeded bent grass putting green, and I had mentioned that there'll be another follow-up paper to that that had to do with the established putting green from Dr. McCarty and Matt Gregg. I'm going to go over that next week. So look forward to that and then um yeah so look forward to that and th th for tomorrow night at nine we'll have a guest author on that you'll definitely want to be here for i certainly admire him and to be frank i'm 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 shocked he <laughs> he agreed to come on my show i mean someone like that you think of as you know much higher level than than me and like, what does he want to do with my little pib squeak show? But um, nevertheless, he's, you know, I'm glad he's coming on. So I hope I don't screw it up. And then on Thursday morning at 10 a.m., we'll have another guest author talking about thatch. So that's this week. And then um, look forward to the established putting green mint grass next week. Jeremy says it's chilly, 22 degrees in Michigan. There's, there's such an eclectic group here. We have people from all over the planet. And then we, and within, even within the United States, like I would think the majority of people would be from where the majority of people are, like New York or Florida or California or something. But there's people from Ohio and Kentucky and Massachusetts and Michigan. It's a very, very eclectic audience that, that I have here. So welcome. Let's get into it. Today's article is entitled Thatch and Quality of Tiff Way Bermuda Grass Turf in Relation to Fertility and Cultivation. Now, this is a, obviously a warm season turf grass, and it's Bermuda grass as a home lawn, which might sound foreign to most people, but huge areas of the Midwest are Bermuda grass home lawns, like Oklahoma, northern Texas, southern Texas. I mean, there's a lot of Bermuda grass home lawns that, um, you know, that this would relate to, but it is a warm season grass. So we've, we've talked about a lot of cool season grass and, um, today's a warm season grass. This was published in agronomy journal in 1987 by Carol Johnson and Burns. So for those who, uh, maybe knew or haven't um, had an opportunity to, to listen to any of the episodes, 
These journal articles can be downloaded oftentimes for free if they're open access. Um, agronomy journal is not open access, but some articles in agronomy journal can be open access if the authors paid their the fee for that. I don't believe this one is, but you can go to agronomy.org or crops.org or soils.org. It all those are the tri societies, and it all directs you to the same place basically, and look up the abstract for free. And I encourage you to uh, to do that. Um, not only just for this article, but you can also search their articles by topic or by author or by year or whatever and find articles that might be important for you. So if you're looking up chinch bug resistance or something or somebody came across and said this is a product that'll you know, alleviate soil compaction by shooting air into the soil, we'll get to that, I promise. You can go to those three trust societies, the websites there, crops.org, agronomy.org, and soils.org. And you can search for articles. Those are our top tier journals. And you might not be able to read the article and download the whole article, but you can certainly find the title and the authors and read the abstract. And if you're so inclined to really pursue the literature further, then you can become a member, which mine is up for renewal. I'm not going to show the, the paper because I might have some membership information on there I don't want out but um mine's up for renewal so what I'll probably do um sometime soon is I'll actually re-update my membership online on the show so you can actually follow me how I do it and I'm going to do it differently than I have done in the past because I think I can do it and save myself some money because they've changed the the access to the articles to where now you have access to it says, it says your membership now unlocks unlimited access to the ASA, CSSA, and the SSSA journals in our library, eliminating the need for separate purchases. I used to have to order, like you have to get, you have to pay whatever it was, $50 a year for crop science and $50 a year for JEQ and so forth. And now I guess you get them all. So I'll do that online sometime soon. I got to figure out how to do that without exposing my membership numbers and whatever confidential information i don't know what it would be but whatever is online that i need to make, need to remain confidential on i'll i'll do that so you guys can know how to do that anyway let's get started thatch and quality of tiff way bermuda grass turf in relation to fertility and cultivation this is a, a really good article i like this article we're actually going to go over this article again in the future when we get to potassium because this has a lot of potassium information in there and this is one of the few articles that shows an influence from the application of potassium. Um, so I'll end up going over this again in the future, but it'll be from a potassium perspective. And today it's from a thatch perspective. I'm just gonna read a little bit about the introduction because I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on it, but um, high fertility levels are often necessary on recreational sites to promote rapid growth for recovery from traffic, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they result in thatch problems. You're gonna re we're going to find out in this article that oftentimes nitrogen applications are um, associated with increased thatch production. But uh, there's other articles that show that they're not. And if you remember a couple of episodes ago, I talked about thatch is not like nitrogen where we kind of understand it. We understand nitrogen. You apply this rate on this turf at this time and you should expect this. You apply... Too much, you should expect this. You apply too little, you should expect this. And for the most part, we're very, com very comfortable with those recommendations. But thatch management is not that way. We can't say you should top dress and you're going to see reduction in thatch by 50%. And you should airify and you're going to see a re reduction by whatever percent. You may or you may not. And when it comes to nitrogen, you know, the concept has been, well, well, oftentimes is in the literature, you'll see, well, you apply nitrogen, you're going to see increase in thatch production. But sometimes you'll find it doesn't. And sometimes you'll find top uh, uh, verticutting reduces organic matter and thatch production. Sometimes you find it doesn't. So let's not lose sight of that when we're going through these, this literature is that thatch is a big black box of unknown causes. We kind of have a vague idea of what influences it and a little bit of an idea of how to manage it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you should expect to see 
some outcome from our recommendations when it comes to thatch. In general, we can kind of guide, guide you, but my confidence in the outcome of thatch management is very, very low compared to my confidence in the outcome of, say, phosphorus applications or nitrogen applications or PGR applications, something like that. Okay, so keep that in mind. And he's going to make a point of that in this actual, in this article. Thatch is the intermingled, okay, I'm not going to go over the thatch definition, but it's, you know, the intermingled material at the top of the, above the soil surface. A recent survey, this was, now this was in 1987, a recent survey indicated that 77% of lawn care companies offered core aeration to their customers. So this may be an add-on to your normal services. Core aeration and dethatching are the two most common add-on services that lawn care companies use to diversify their business. All right, now this, this was conducted in Georgia. I'm assuming it's conducted. I'll get to the materials and methods in a minute, but I haven't gone over these, this Sheldon 1985 article or the Fariga 1986 article that he cites as, you know, those with those percentages and so forth, but I, I probably will. The Landry 1985 paper recently questioned the indiscriminate use of core aeration where compaction or thatch were not existing problems. In studies on zoysia grass, Weston and Dunn 1985 and Dunn 1981 reported that core aeration and vertical mowing could decrease thatch by 8 to 25%, but reduced turf quality. Okay, so you're going to go in there and start tearing stuff up and removing the thatch. You're going to have an influence on the turf quality. Okay, our in, so he's talking about the paper. Our interest was in evaluating the use of secondary cultural practices on Tifway Bermuda grass maintained under home lawn conditions in conjunction with nitrogen and potassium fertilization regimes. Of special interest were the effects of these practices on turf grass quality and thatch accumulation under fertility regimes commonly encountered on home lawns. Since fertility rates on home lawns are often less than those on recreational turf, home lawns may be more susceptible to injurious influences of these mechanical practices and slower to recover. Okay, so he's going to look at what happens on home lawns because there's, there's probably more, there's less of an ability to recuperate from damage. Of course, one can argue there's less damage. So they don't, they don't need to have, compared to sport turf, they don't need to have as much nitrogen. But that's, that's the background. That's the justification for the work. Materials and methods. The study was initiated in the spring of 1982 on Tiffery Bermuda grass at Griffin in the Piedmont region of Georgia. So here's the treatments. Treatments consisted of three rates each of nitrogen and potassium and nine secondary cultural practices. Nitrogen fertilizations were one pound, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, two pounds, four pounds, and six pounds per year, applied in four equal applications in the middle of April, 1st of June, middle of July, and the 1st of September. So he has two, four, and six pounds of nitrogen going out beginning in April, throughout the summer, and ending, and ending in the beginning of September. Remember, this is Bermuda grass. Potassium fertilization treatments consisted of one pound, two pounds, or four pounds of potassium applied with the nitrogen. Now, if you remember... We went over, I went over very, very early on, and I'll probably end up just doing this again when I get to the potassium. I went over the nitrogen potassium ratio papers by Snyder, and there was very clear evidence that the application of potassium greater than a two to one in decay did not result in concomitant benefits to the turf. In other words, when there was a potassium deficiency on Bermuda grass, to alleviate that potassium deficiency only required about uh, the inclusion of potassium with your next nitrogen application at about half the rate, assuming you're applying nitrogen at, you know, normal application rates, a half a pound to one pound of nitrogen. Then you would apply half that as potassium and that um, very rapidly brought the turf grass out of that potassium deficiency. And you'll see that here where they're splitting it in half. So if you had applied two pounds of N, they applied one pound of K. Well, they, they applied all these rates with them, but 
you can see that the potassium rates were exactly half of the nitrogen rates. Okay. Or they at least had that combination in there. Okay, ammonium nitrate was the nitrogen source, and muriate of potash was the was the potassium carrier. So an, an all okay, so all pots received, I'm coming back to this. All pots received, all plots received one pound of P on April 15th as triple superphosphate and four pounds of nitrogen and two pounds of potassium rates per year. Oh, no, he just says that's common. Four pounds and two pounds of care are common for home loans in the region. So again, I've talked about this in the past and I'll continue to talk about it when the opportunity comes up. He used potassium chloride as his potassium source. Here's another small example, but yet it's very important to understand why I don't recommend doing your own research. Okay, if he had used potassium sulfate rather than potassium chloride, and he saw a response to it, we would not have known whether or not the response was from the potassium or the sulfate. Now, this was in the 80s, so there's a good chance it would have been from the potassium because the sulfate in the soil was so high back then. But, you know, these researchers are not just, you know, goofballs walking around, you know, trying to, you know, <laughs> do whatever. I mean, they know what they're doing. Well, when they know what they're doing, you can tell by the way they set it up. I mean, Bob knows what he's doing when he'd set this up. He wants to know from potassium, not the chances of screwing things up by adding it with sulfate. Okay. And so that's very good. Again, if you don't know that and you go and, um, hang on a second, I got to reply to this. And you go and you um, put out potassium sulfate, like I've mentioned, and you see a response to it, you're very likely to be very convinced that the response was indeed from potassium when in fact you, you can't tell that. Um, hang on. So anyway, okay, core aeration was with uh, one third centimeter, one third inch diameter tines, or maybe that's a core, uh, it's, yeah, third, whatever, a little less than half an inch. Diameter tines spaced on two inch, two inches apart, and they went three inches deep. Vertical mowing was done with solid tines, I'm sorry, solid blades spaced one inch apart. And adjusted and adjusted to just above the soil surface. The debris was hand raked off the plot. So when they the corrugation treatment, that's how they did it, and the vertical mowing treatment, that's how they did it. Sand with, with a particle size of this particle size and diameter was used for top dressing. So they did corrugation, verticutting, and top dressing. Whoops. The fine textured, poor structured soil used in this research study is typical for the Piedmont region, except for routine maintenance operations, the site was not compacted. Thus, our growing conditions would be similar to many home lawns in the region, as contrasted to a recreational turf, where many of the mechanical treatments in the study would be routinely applied to reduce thatch or to alleviate compaction. So he's just saying it was maintained as a home lawn and it is very different than a sport turf um, setting. Turf shoot density was visually was visually estimated using a scale of one equals no live turf seven is the minimal acceptable and then 10 was ideal i found the paper um that uh i think it was matt from the grass factor asked me a couple a little while ago on the on the channel about um having an objective measurement of turf quality or how is it done and i found the paper that um discusses that and then I also found a more detailed explanation on an, on an association's website that is very well established and very well used. And I'll probably go through that here sometime soon. It's not really a full blown article per se, but um, I'll explain in more detail uh, how turf quality ratings are typically conducted and what criteria are included. But one of those criteria is turf density, and they just explain turf density. That one of the other criteria is, is turf color. Color ratings in this study were made by visual observations of the scale of one, no green turf, seven equals acceptable color, and 10 equals dark green color. So quality is a is a the overall metric often used in this paper. They broke that out and used two of the criteria in quality, which is density and color. 
The remaining thatch soil material. Okay, so he's talking about thatch, talking about how he measured thatch. They took some cores, and then the remaining thatch soil material was dried, dried, and then they did through weight loss on, on ignition. Each sample was then combusted at 600 degrees Celsius. And we talked about the differences in measuring thatch and the in the variation in those measurements. And he's going to talk about that in this paper too. But they did it by weight loss on ignition. Available soil potassium was determined by Malik 1 with the soil test values of 0 to 50 being low, 51 to 100 being medium, and 101 to 175 being high. 176 plus, oh, oh, 176 or greater being very high. Dollar spot was also rated on a, on a scale of 1 being no disease. We're going to show this in a minute. So remember that when I say 1, it means 1 equals no disease. And 10 equals 90 to 100% of the plot area affected by dollar spot. So you're going to see these numbers on a, on a table in a minute. It's going to be like 1.4 or 2 or whatever. What that is, it is a visual assessment of dollar spot on the plot. And 1 being the least and 10 being the greatest. Okay. So that's what they did. They, they have Bermuda grass, they have um, nitrogen, potassium being applied, they have airification, verticutting, and top dressing being applied, and they measure, they're measuring turf color, turf density, thatch by weight loss on ignition, and, uh, and um, well, soil K as well. That's sort of secondary. And they're measuring dollar spot. Okay, and they're in Georgia. Okay, results and discussion. Nitrogen. During each year of the study, Increasing nitrogen resulted in more dense turf grass, figure one, with better color, figure two. Using, or I'm sorry, use of four pounds of nitrogen produced an acceptable shoot density as demonstrated by turf density ratings of at least seven. So if you want to know how we do, why we have certain nitrogen recommendations, you're going to find out a little bit more detail here when I show these graphs. And I'm going to show here in a minute. I actually highlighted in yellow, I think, why it's important or what he, what he did. These data indicate that about four pounds of nitrogen per year is satisfactory for a dense Tifway Bermuda grass stand under our growing conditions, but a higher nitrogen rate would be necessary for an acceptable green color. Okay, so we found plenty of density, but not quite enough color with the four pounds of nitrogen. Since density and color were both enhanced by the highest nitrogen rate of six pounds of N, we did not determine the maximum annual nitrogen rate to achieve the highest density and color. Okay, so let me show these graphs. I'm sorry for those listening. I'll do my best to describe them verbally. What he's saying is, is that they only used two pounds, four pounds, and six pounds of nitrogen. And when we go out to do a calibration study, we have to pick rates. We have to pick zero. Unfortunately, he didn't have a zero in the study, but we have to pick usually zero, none. And then we have to start picking rates. One, two, three, four, five, whatever. And each time you pick a rate, it's a treatment. And each time it's a treatment, it's multiplied by the reps. So you can't just think of it as, Oh, I'm just throwing any rate I want because it quickly compounds out of control, the study. So you have to pick some range and you're hoping that the range you pick contains the lowest possible value that where, where you definitely won't see any effect or you'll see a deleterious problem or problem, you know, problem with the turf. And then you're hoping you'll pick a rate so high that the turf grass will have already reached its maximum. And then you can back it down to whatever rate you want because you have the entire scale. But in this study, the six pounds of nitrogen per year did not result in the maximum density or the maximum color. So if you look here on the graph, so I'm looking at a graph of a three, a one graph with three panels. 1983 is one panel, 1984, 1985 are the other panels. And it goes from May, June, July, August, and September. And it's a line graph. They're all line graphs. And on the y-axis on this um, graph is turf density. And it goes from the turf density at the bottom of the scale is 5.5 and the top of the scale is 10. Remember, 7 was the minimum acceptable limit. So this is the, I'm drawing a line here across 7. And so we can see the 2 pounds of nitrogen per year on Bermuda grass really never reached the acceptable limit of density. There was one here in August of 1983. 
Oh, no, over here in 1985 they did. Okay, so 1983, 1984 didn't really receive the density, but in 1985, the density from the two-pound application was acceptable in the, in the eights, in eights and a half, okay, from the, from the two pounds of nitrogen. When we go up to four pounds of nitrogen, the four-pound nitrogen started off in May of 1983, unacceptable, but after that, the four pounds of nitrogen resulted in acceptable density every year. And the six pounds was acceptable above seven every month of every year but he didn't reach 10 so up here none of the densities ever reached 10 we're talking nine nine and a half okay throughout the years i guess the lowest was seven and a half but it never reached its maximum density potential so what he's saying in that previous sentence is we don't know what the maximum would be because we didn't reach the maximum using the rates we you the highest rate we used that was 1970s, 80s, 90s, and even early part of 2000s, that's kind of the way their thought process was because we were, I don't know why they did it, but the, the thought process, I think, is because they're somewhat still in the ag mentality. We're trying to maximize yields. But in today's world, today's turf grass industry, oftentimes we're not looking at maximizing turf density because that's that comes with an association to increase yields, increase clipping volumes that are sometimes not desired. So instead, what we're looking for is a, a minimum acceptable limit. So if it's acceptable or is it not, ultimately, well, that's what it comes down to. Is the turf acceptable or is it not acceptable? And if it is acceptable, then you're good. And if it's not acceptable, then we can start fidgeting with the dials, the nitrogen dials and potassium, you know, all these things. In this case, six pounds was acceptable the entire time. Four pounds was acceptable the entire time except for one month at the very beginning of the study. So these are how calibrations are conducted. Where I would say we're pretty confident that early on you probably need about four pounds a year on Bermuda grass in Georgia on a home lawn. But as the years go by, you can see this two pound was acceptable in the density range and density area for the entire year of 1985, but it wasn't early on. Okay, so. Uh, these are how recommendations are generated, really. Okay, very very common to see these things. Let's look at the color. When we look at the color, the, again, the color um, minimum was 7. I'm going to draw a line across there at 7. And you can see the color was not acceptable from the 2 pounds of nitrogen in the first year or the second, 1983 or 1984. And it was marginally acceptable in 1985. It probably was right at the line in 1985. Whereas the four pounds and six pounds, similar to the density, were acceptable for pretty much the entire time. Okay, except for maybe early on when the turf's coming out of dormancy in May. Okay, so we have a four pound rate and we have a two pound rate. I'm sorry, we have a four pound rate and a six pound rate that are pretty much acceptable in density and color for a long period of time. And the two-pound rate was not acceptable at all for the first two years, but it was was probably acceptable after that, 1985. Okay. I wanted to point that out because a lot of these things go unpublished, where we do calibration studies and we, we do recommendations based on the calibrations. Sometimes we don't publish them; we're just doing them for internal usage at universities. And in this case, he published. This is a calibration study. He published it, and it's uh, good to see that. Okay, so. That's what I want to talk about in that. Okay, so now we go to the next paragraph. Nitrogen did not influence thatch accumulation as determined by organic matter content over the three-year period, Table 1. So I'm going to read this and then come back to Table 1 because I highlighted it in yellow for a reason. He's going to talk about all this other stuff from other people. And it's important because it contextualizes the, the, the model, if you will, of turf grass thatch. The relationship of nitrogen to thatch accumulation has been controversial. Beard in 1973 indicated that excessively high nitrogen contributes to thatch, whereas Sherman in 1983 reported no influence of nitrogen on Kentucky bluegrass thatch at annual levels of 2 pounds to 4 pounds a year. On Meyer zoysia, Dunn in 1981 noted no influence of nitrogen on thatch at, in, at annual nitrogen rates of 4.5 pounds to seven pounds, I think that is, of, of nitrogen per year. In a later study on the same grass, 
increasing nitrogen from zero to two pounds of nitrogen substantially increased that, but there was no further increase between two pounds and four pounds. Okay, based on these studies, it appears that applying nitrogen to a nitrogen deficient turf could cause some increase in thatch. And at very high levels of nitrogen levels, thatch may also be enhanced. However, within the normal use rates of this study, there was no relationship between nitrogen fertilization and thatch accumulation on Tifway Bermuda grass. So what he's saying, to sum that up, and I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, what, what, um, what Dr. Carroll is saying is, is that when there's no nitrogen at all, and the turf grass is um, suffering from nitrogen deficiency, and you apply some nitrogen, there may be some increase in thatch. Of course, there's gonna be some increase in turf grass tissue, there's gonna be an increase in thatch when the nitrogen is deprived of nitrogen so much that there's no growth, essentially. On, and that's on the low end. On the high end, when the turf grass is fine and you're pushing it so heavy, you're putting six pounds, eight pounds, 10 pounds a year out there, you will also see a relationship between applying that much nitrogen and an increase in thatch production. Okay, that's been fairly consistent in the literature. But in the middle zone, where we're not dealing with completely deficient nitrogen turf grass, or superfluous amounts of nitrogen being applied where it's just you're pushing it so hard you're not dealing with the, the extremes you're dealing with the middle zone where normal applications of nitrogen say one to four pounds of nitrogen something around that per year depending on where you're at in the turf grass and so forth well when you're in that range you don't really see a lot of influence of nitrogen on thatch production okay so and, and i wanted to point that out because that's one thing we're, we're saying when it comes to thatch. Not, it's not really one size fits all. Well, you do this and that's going to happen. You do that, that's going to happen because there's so much variation, particularly in the literature. And he, some, he sort of contextualizes the whole thing a little bit clearer than I could. When it's low and you add some, you could have a, you could have development. When it's high and you don't need to add any more, but you continue to add more, you could have a problem. But in the middle range where you're just keeping the grass healthy and acceptable, generally there's less of an influence on thatch when you apply nitrogen, okay? Let's go back to the PDF. Let's look at, let's look at table one here, if I can get it on the screen, which I cannot. Let's see if I can get it on there. <clears throat> okay, table one is titled, The Influence of Fertilization Averaged Over Cultivation Treatment on Thatch dollar spot infection and potassium soil test results there, he's going to refer back to this table in the next couple of paragraphs so i'm just going to go over it now and then i'll just refer back to it when i'm speaking about it on the far left column we have fertilization we have nitrogen at two four and six pounds and we have potassium at one two and four pounds okay the next column is organic matter thatch and we see that there was no influence of nitrogen on the organic matter, or the thatch measured by organic matter. There was no influence of the potassium at, on thatch as measure, measured by organic matter. Okay. When we look at the dollar spot in 1984, now he only measured dollar spot when it was prevalent, when it was, when it was there. And we see that nitrogen applied at two pounds resulted in a three, well, I was three out of 10, remember, of dollar spot. And look what happens when we apply a little bit more nitrogen. Four and six pounds, the dollar spot incidence goes down. This is pretty consistent in the literature. When you're applying a little nitrogen or no nitrogen, you have some, so much, you have X amount of dollar spot, you apply a little bit more nitrogen and you're going to see May, June, and August. All of these dollar spot incidences are going to go down as the nitrogen application rate goes up. Okay, so there's an advantage to applying a little bit more nitrogen. Of course, there's a disadvantage as well, but that's one advantage when it comes to dollar spot. But look what happens with the potassium. We're going to go back to this uh, in the future. Okay, excuse me. Um, there is slight, very slight, I don't know if it's agronomically significant, but there is a statistical significance of the increase in dollar spot resulting 
from the increase in potassium in May. So when you applied one pound of potassium, you see 1.4 on the rating scale of dollar spot. When you applied four pounds, you, it, it goes up to 1.8. So we can argue whether that's agronomically um, significant. But there is clearly an association, a clearly a, a significant you know, influence from applying more potassium and you're increasing the dollar spot. Now you're gonna we're gonna go over papers from Wisconsin. We're gonna go over papers from New York when we get to potassium, and those are gonna show. Oh no, was it Wisconsin? Yeah, I think it was Wisconsin. When those are gonna show a much stronger relationship between applying excess potassium and resulting in disease outbreak. So whenever you've heard me say, I wouldn't apply anything unless I have a good reason, that comes from years and years of experience and reading papers where I'm aware that there are associations between applying things and, and a benefit, but I'm also so aware of applying things and having a disadvantage, and you don't know about it. You're, not, you're unaware that applying potassium would result in disease incidence increases. Okay, this is one of the early papers that showed a little bit of a tendency. Now here we, sh we show no increase in, in June, no association in June and August. We don't see an increase, but we do, you know, we do see a, I wouldn't, I don't like this word, but a tendency or a trend in the, in the numbers to move up. There's no statistical association here or relations or significance, but there was in May. So this is, again, this is one reason of many, many reasons why I do not recommend applying potassium unless you have a good reason, meaning there's a, a visual potassium deficiency and or there's a strong uh, conviction that the soil test is you know, indicating there's probably a deficiency in potassium. And when you do have a deficiency in potassium, you don't need to apply a lot. There are numerous papers that we'll go over that show Potassium deficiencies can easily be alleviated by just applying a little bit of potassium. Applying more isn't going to help. And this 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 happened years ago where there was this uh I don't know who it came from, but there's this concept of um of luxury consumption of potassium. Oh, you can still apply potassium, you apply a lot of potassium because it's going to luxury consume it. It's going to apply it's going to take up more than it needs and it's going to be used later. I don't care. Show me how that's a benefit. It, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that that can occur. I'm not going to refute that or argue that. High, you know, uh, luxury consumption can occur. So what? So so what? Who cares? Luxury consumption can occur on almost every element. Show me how hyperinflating the potassium pool in the soil and then in the plant is going to benefit me by benefiting the turf or increasing it beyond you know some acceptable limit or whatever. Then that's convincing evidence because what I'm seeing in the literature over many decades is that excess of applications of potassium increases the risk of disease occurrence. Okay, so keep this in mind as we move into potassium whenever we get to it in a month or two. Okay, we're going to come back to this paper. Okay, dollar spot infection declined as in rate increase. I just showed you that. But let's go to potassium. Potassium significantly influenced shoot density, figure three, and color, figure four. So you might read that and go, <laughs> well, yeah, the, Travis, you've been saying potassium doesn't do much. Shouldn't really apply that much potassium, right? <laughs> you, you could read that if you just read that sentence. And you go, well, Here's a paper that shows potassium. You should apply potassium, right? So hold, but hold your horses, especially in 1983, 94, but to a much lesser degree than did nitrogen. So potassium significantly influenced shoot density and color. Okay. This is a, this is an example of, um, you have to contextualize everything. You can't just pull a sentence out and somebody pulls that sentence out and puts it on a marketing sheet to sell potassium. Technically they're correct because that's what was in the paper, but it's the same as if you only read the Bible verse, money is the root of all evil. You'd go, well, of course the Bible says that. 
money is the root of all evil. It does say that. But if you read the preceding three or four words, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, so those are completely two different contexts. I mean, it's completely different. Money is not the root of all evil, according to the Bible. It's, it's the love of the money. It's the same thing here. If you read this and you go, potassium significantly influences shoot density and color. Well, yeah, potassium influences shoot density and color. That's correct. That's what it says. So let, but let's go look at it. Better density and color were observed at the lowest annual potassium rate of one pound. So let's look at potassium. Now, unfortunately, they did not have a zero. They did not have a non-treated control here. You know, it is what it is. But let's look and see what happened with potassium. When you apply one pound of potassium, you see the turf density was already a seven, but it goes from seven. This was in, we're looking at a graph, line graph, same as the other ones where we have months. Okay, and turf densities on the y-axis, months, 1983, 84, 85 on the x-axis. And as the summer um, continues, you see the quality go up, the density go up throughout the summer. We don't have a non-treated control. So I don't know where the line would be if you didn't do any potassium. Okay. Well, I do know where the line is if you apply more than one pound. And the line goes down. <laughs> and you see it's significant. It's significant in May, June, August, and September. When you see an NS over here and these other ones, that means that the difference was not significant. So when you apply one pound of N, you get whatever response. And again, I don't know if that would be different than applying nothing. I don't know. But if you apply two pounds or you apply four pounds, what I can say in this study in Georgia in 1983 and 1984 on a home lawn on Bermuda grass, the, qual the density went down when you applied more potassium. Okay. So it, this is not, um, you know, <laughs> something to look over. More potassium does not automatically equal better turf. Okay. In most cases, there's much more evidence to support the opposite. More potassium is going to re result in less quality turf. In this case, it's certainly the case for lower density turf. Okay, so unfortunately, he didn't have a non-treated control because I, su I suspect the non-treated control would have been somewhere around this line, but I don't know. I can't, can't say that. I'm just speculating. But if you're out there applying, you know, two pounds of nitrogen or one, you're applying, let's say you're applying one pound of nitrogen um, well, let's say you're applying two pounds of nitrogen or you're applying, you're applying uh, equal rates of N to K and you're applying two or three pounds of nitrogen per year, or you're applying, well, let's see what, what did they do? Was this per year? Let's go back and look at the, the materials and methods make sure I'm not consistent. So potassium, yeah, one pound, two pounds or four pounds per year. So if you go out and you go, you go out and you apply one pound of nitrogen with one pound of K in May, and you go and you apply one pound of nitrogen with one pound of K in July, and you end up applying four pounds of K for the year on Bermuda grass lawns in Georgia, what this is saying is you, you, you're going to result likely, at least in the, under the conditions of this study, you're going to result, likely result in a reduced quality, reduced density than if you just applied one pound of K. So if you want to know how to save money as a lawn care operator or a sport turf or golf course manager. Here is again, more evidence to not apply these very high rates of potassium. It's not resulting in any concomitant benefit to you. All right. And this is going to be a very consistent result in the literature. And we're going to, I'll show it as long as you want to. I'll sit and talk about potassium for years. Thatch is an, <laughs> it's another issue, but for, um, for potassium or nitrogen, you know, I'll talk about this till I'm blue in the face. Stop applying so much potassium. You probably don't need much at all. And applying more is not only probably not going to help in some cases, it's actually going to cause more problems. Let's look what happened with the color and you'll see the same 
situation where the color, now we're looking at the next figure, turf color from two to 10, minimum is seven, right? And you see one pound of potassium per year resulting in acceptable turf grass quality, or I'm sorry, turf grass color. And these, you know, two pounds and four pounds of potassium are not helping. In this case, it's actually reducing again the color. It's resulting in a reduction in color, these higher rates of potassium, okay? So this is a thatch theme paper. We're going to get to that, and you know we already actually got that briefly. But you know I wanted to go over this because it has so much good information on potassium in here as well. You got to apply potassium. You got to apply, a, you know, thirteen, thirteen, thirteen. My grandfather applied thirteen, thirteen, thirteen. I think every year of his life on his lawn. I don't even <laughs> know how many pounds of phosphorus potassium he wasted. Because he wanted to go out there that 13, 13, 13. That's, that's antiquated thinking. And it is, it is in many, many cases inconsistent with the body of evidence. Okay, you're, you, of course you're going to see a good response. Yes, the nitrogen's there. You're going to see a good turf response. That's not what's in question. What's in question is, do you really need the phosphorus and potassium? It, probably not. I can't say that unless I know more information about your situation. But you probably don't need near that much potassium. There's more likely an, a, a chance that you could need some of the phosphorus. But the potassium is grossly oversold and overapplied. I've said this before on many, many occasions. I have never personally seen a turf grass response to applied potassium in my career, ever. Uh, I'm, I know it exists. Here's a negative response right here. I went over the NK paper from Snyder. He showed a positive response. We're going to show some other papers that show a positive response. But I've never actually personally seen it, despite my best efforts to, to induce a potassium deficiency and then see a response. I've never seen it. So it doesn't mean you won't, but consider that if you're looking to um, fine-tune your fertility program when you're moving into purchasing for the next season. If, you're, if you have any amount of potassium in your blend, ask yourself, why is that in there? And if you don't have a good reason, then consider, consider you know, either lowering it or omitting it or getting a hold of me and we'll talk about it. You know, it's a good opportunity if you, if you are in the world of turf grass and you want some help, I do still provide that consulting services if you go to calendly.com slash travis shaddix you can see my calendar and sign up for that and we can talk one-on-one -on -one if you want to all right let's get to thatch accumulation accumulation with potassium thatch accumulation was not influenced by potassium fertilization <laughs> real simple in this case you probably want that a slight influence on dollar spot instance by potassium was noted with less disease occurring at the lowest potassium le level we just talked about that too Okay, in the table above. From these divergent results on Bermuda grass, it is obvious that the potassium influence on dollar spot is not well defined. So he talks about the jury, and, um, the Juice Gun Murray in 1974 found just the opposite result with greater dollar spot at the lowest level. And Horn in 1969 applied the same total quantity of potassium in a single sprit, single spring versus four equal applications. And the relationship between potassium rate and dollar spot was reversed. So we'll see, again, literature where we see, you know, more potassium, less potassium. And in, even today, we will see excessive amount of potassium result in disease, greater disease occurrence for specific diseases like microdochium. And we'll see low end, the low end of potassium resulting in increased disease occurrence with a different disease with, with like say anthracnose on poa putting greens or something like that. Or we'll see disease occurrence is high at the extreme high or extreme low application rates of potassium. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I, just, I'm, I'm, I think it might have something to do with the hormones that are generated at low and high amounts of potassium, but I don't, I don't, know, I don't know enough about that. You, know, you get a physiologist and a pathologist on here and discuss it, but there's hormones in the plant called things like putricide and that tend to elevate at very low and very high levels of potassium but i don't know if that's because it's decaying the, the tissue is decaying or if that's causing the tissue to decay i don't know but regardless there's clearly more information today than there was back then 
And he's saying there's some conflict, conflicting information in the literature where l- sometimes the low causes more disease. Sometimes the high causes or results in more disease. And what we're seeing today is, yes, we're seeing that ex- exact same thing still occur today, but it's usually specific to the turf and the disease itself. Okay, so the medium zone of potassium, sort of the happy Goldilocks zone, there's, there's very little information in the literature where it shows that those rates and those soil test potassium levels are associated with disease occurrence. It's usually when it's very, very low or it's very, very high. At the end of the study, potassium soil test levels were influenced by nitrogen treatments with soil K declining with increased N rates. So the more nitrogen you put on, the, the less soil potassium was extracted. Since the turf grass grew more rapidly at the high end rates, more clippings were removed from these plots, thereby removing more K. So I highlighted that because this was in the 80s where, you know, back then we very rarely let tissue, the clippings stay on the grass. We removed them back then. And today we don't do that. And here's one example as to why we don't do that is because we're depleting, we're harvesting basically the potassium out of the soil and other nutrients out of the soil. That we, when we take the clippings off, we take those nutrients off. And today we're very aware that we, you know, the, the problems with that. And generally we don't do that anymore. Okay, let's look at core aeration. When the cores were removed, core aeration decreased shoot density from August of the first year until August of the second year. Regardless of whether coring was conducted once March or twice March and June per year, it was, that's what happened. Evidently, the injurious effect of coring was not offset by any beneficial improvements that would enhance shoot growth. He's going to use that as, an, as, an, as a means to defend a position later on. Okay. In other words, when he cored it, there was intended to be a benefit. He didn't see a benefit, and the damage still existed. So the damage, the damage that occurred um, with the intent of enhancing turf later on, we didn't see that happen in this study for core aeration. Core aeration twice per year with the cores returned significantly decreased turf shoot density in the fall of 1983. However, when this operation was confined to once per year, shoot density was the same as that of the control in 1983 and better at times in 1984 and 1985. By aerating early and filling the holes with the soil from the cores, the Bermuda grass could quickly fill any voids from the core operation. Also, the soil as the top dressing may have been beneficial in covering stolons for better growth. So in other words, re- return the cores, don't remove them. That was the benefit. That was, that's where you saw a benefit. When they didn't remove them, I'm sorry, when they did remove them was when there was a, long, a long-term sort of problem or longer-term problem. Okay, then here you see the coring. This is the same sort of graphs. The control where we did nothing, and then he did coring on March 1 or June or March and June. And you can see that the reduction in density existed every year, basically, except for the third year, 1985, I guess is what he said in the paper. But, but rarely do we see a, what is it? This is, not sure why. Let me look down here. I have to read the description. The influence of cultivation practice on shoot density of Tiffer and LSD. Now at that particular date, not sure why they have, I must, I'm, I don't know. I don't know about this graph. I should have looked into this more. Oh, I, oh, I see. These were where cores were removed. When the cores were removed, we saw a reduction in the, the density. When the cores were returned, we saw less of an influence of the coring. So in other words, return the cores. When you did, when he did dethatching, which was the vertical mowing, when you did nothing, you saw the, the quality of the density um, be quite high. When you dethatched it in March, in March and June, that's when we saw a reduction in the density in May, June, and July, um, basically the whole year. And it wasn't until the 1985, the third year, where uh, vertical mowing did not have an influence on density. So vertical mowing reduced the density, resulted in a reduction in density. You didn't see a benefit in terms of increased growth following the, co- the vertical mowing that you would hope you'd see. You'd hope you'd see greater quality turf, greater dense turf, and so forth following um, whatever method you did to remove the thatch. And they didn't see that the first two years. The third year, they finally saw some. And then here's the top dressing. The top dressing 
we saw uh, March 1 and March and June 1, you saw the double top dressing have a reduction in the density in the first year. In the second two years, you didn't see a whole lot going on when it comes to top dressing. So we did not see an increase in density in the second year. We did not see a decrease in density for the most part. It was the same as doing nothing. We're going to get here to the end here real quick. Core aeration with cores returned is often suggested as a means of thatch control. When the soil intermingles with the thatch, a better environment of micro, microorganism activity on the thatch should be produced. Thatch data obtained near the end of the study revealed very little influence on thatch from core aeration. Table 3. So you can see that in Table 3, the thatch and dollars, this is, oops, let me back this, I always do that. In table three, it has the thatch dollar spot infection and potassium soil test results as influenced by cultivation practice on turf receiving the four pounds and two pounds of, uh, per year of nitrogen and potassium, respectively. And what he's saying here is that in table three, thatch data obtained near the end of the study revealed very little influence on thatch from core aeration. And so what he's talking about here is this column right here, organic matter thatch. And there wasn't, here's the control, which is a B on the, Thing on the whatever, on the statistical significance. And <clears throat> the correlation is the same for these three. The only one that showed a difference was um, the core number one, which was just the one application, or the one coring, and the cores were removed, where you saw a reduction in the organic matter from the thatch. Oh, I'm sorry, you saw an increase. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. You saw an increase. So if you if you removed it, then you actually saw an increase in the organic matter thatch. That's that's bizarre. But you didn't see these are bees, bees, and bees. So you didn't see anything happen from coring when it comes to the thatch in this study as measured by organic matter. The only thing that did show a response was the dethatching, the vertical slicing, vertical mowing twice a year showed a reduction, and the top dressing showed a reduction in the percent organic matter of the thatch. <clears throat> so here we're going to talk about, he's going to discuss about the differences in measuring thatch here. One difficulty in comparing thatch accumulation results from various research studies is the matter of the measurement technique. Many researchers have used thatch thickness method, while others have used organic matter by combustion method. Whenever treatments mix sand or soil into the thatch to form a mat, thickness determines, determinations are very difficult to make. In this paper, all comparisons between our results and those of others were on a percent basis based on thatch thickness of the control or organic matter content of the control to assist in meaningful comparisons. So what he's saying is, you're trying to compare apples to oranges if you're going from one paper to another paper and you're measured thatch differently. Okay, and, I, and I've shown many, in many times before that the measurement by depth is generally more consistent and more meaningful as opposed to organic matter by combustion or compression or anything like that. In this case, he's making the case where, okay, we did it by weight loss line ignition, but we're, we're comparing it apples to apples. We're trying our best to do that. Okay. Anyway, one way or the other, the, the core aeration didn't do anything really. They, they didn't reduce organic matter thatch, the thatch as measured by organic matter. Okay. Okay. Let's look at vertical mowing. During the first two years, vertical mowing or dethatching substantially decreased shoot density, especially when done in March. We talked, we looked at that. It reduced the density when you vertical mowed. Dethatching twice per year enhanced early spring color by exposing the soil, which resulted in greater surface temperatures. He measured that. I'm not a real big um, believer that exposing the soil to sunlight is going to provide any meaningful increase in temperature. I know they measured that and they show a little bit of that in here, but we've done some work on that with colored sands where it's, the sand's black or green or white or whatever. And there is an increase in color from the solar absorption of the solar, of the heat from the sun. There is an increase, but it's usually for the first hour or two of after application of the first day. And as soon as the turf grass um, canopy covers the grass, usually in a day or two, there's no benefit. And so we've done that. We never published that work. We need to publish that. Um, but the benefit of this increase in heat from the exposure to sun, I, I think is, is not well established. Okay. I, I would say that 
any benefit is going to be very short and and it's going to be it's going to fade away in no more than a day or two as long as the turf is actively growing that's for another time when turf was vertical mode only once per year no influence on thatch accumulation was noted at twice per year an 8% reduction in thatch was observed compared to that of the control and that's what i just said top dressing so top dressing and de or, i'm sorry dethatching we saw a reduction in dethatching, um, re reduction in thatch when we dethatched the lawn twice a year. So dethatch the lawn. I just talked about that. That you know the, the gentleman up in Northwest Florida, he comes in there and rips it all out basically with a vertical mower or a vertical not a mower, but I think it's a vertical rake, and he rips all that tissue out, and um, that that's a fairly consistent method of getting it removed. All right, our data in conjunction with this. So here, here comes the important stuff of the conclusions and kind of summing this thing up. So if you're listening, here, you know, li listen up a little closer. Here, here, here we go. In our data in conjunction with the findings of others indicate that dethatching under home lawn maintenance regimes can reduce thatch, but it can also injure turf. The net results may be a reduced turf quality. Thus, dethatching should only be done where an excessive thatch problem already exists and not as a routine maintenance operation. The next several sentences are critical here, or paragraphs. Lawn care companies are increasingly offering add-on services such as vertical mowing and core airifying to their customers. While these practices are very beneficial on high-maintenance recreational sites, the same positive results may not appear on lower maintenance, minimally trafficked home lawns, unless a definite problem such as excess thatch or soil compaction is present. We did not see much of a benefit from this, from these, uh, or certainly in the first two years. We saw a benefit from, from top dressing and from dethatching a little bit at the end of the third year, right? But not in the first couple of years. So, so, as a routine maintenance, what he's saying is if there's not a problem going in and trying to provide a treatment to cure a problem that does not exist is not a best management practice. That's what he's saying. He's going to continue to press that home here in the next couple of paragraphs. On recreational turf grasses, top dressing each year can be a very effective means of controlling thatch. It has not been used on home lawns because of limited availability of equipment and top dressing mix. In late summer and fall of 1983, top dressing twice per year reduced shoot density. Apparently, covering the stolons caused some loss of stand. In early spring 1984, a decline in turf density was again observed. Top dressing once per year did not reduce shoot density except on one date. And by 1985, these plots were exhibiting a trend towards better density than the control. Both top dressing treatments significantly improved turf color in the spring and tended to enhance fall color. Okay. Of the cultivation treatments, top dressing was the most effective in reducing thatch accumulation. Compared to the control, which was no cultivation, top dressing decreased thatch by 44 and 62% for the one and two applications of top dressing respectively. Okay, So in this particular setting under Bermuda grass in Georgia, top dressing should be the, in, in 1987, should be the cultural management practice of choice if you're really looking to have an influence on thatch management. Vertical cutting would be the second one. The lowest soil test levels for potassium appeared for the top dressing plots, table three, but the response was not great. Probably the continual application of new soil simply diluted the potassium and caused slightly lower soil test values. I'm mentioning that because there's a author we've had on here that found the exact opposite. And I want to explain that. And we're going to explain this further when we get to potassium. What he's saying, what the authors here are saying, is that on table three, the top dressing resulted in a reduction two times a year. So we're looking at top dressing. We're looking at potassium soil test. The top dressing resulted in a reduction of potassium. Okay. There's another author who published a paper that showed 
an increase in potassium from top dressing. And we're going to talk about it, and I'll probably have, hopefully I can have him back on, and he can explain that in his own words, why that's the case. In this case, he's saying that potassium, or this author is saying that potassium in the soil decreased as a result of top dressing. But he's saying that's probably a dilution effect. He's diluting the potassium down by applying top dressing that had low potassium in it. We don't know because we don't know what the potassium was in the top dressing. But in the case of the other author where we saw an increase, he went out and measured the potassium in the top dressing material and found that it contained potassium bearing minerals. So depending on what material you're top dressing with, it may actually increase the potassium in the soil, just the top dressing alone. And you don't have to go out and buy any potassium because it's those potassium bearing minerals that are mineralizing potassium over time. So you have to be aware of what type of material you're using to top dress if you're choosing to top dress, because in this case, it might result in a reduction if there's no potassium and you're diluting it down. And in other cases, it might result in an increase. We need to be aware of that um, if you're top dressing, okay? Dollar spot ratings illustrated that several of the cultivation treatments enhanced dollar spot, okay? The twice annual coring and dethatching applications may have caused more severe infection by weakening the turf. So those coring and dethatching methods, which didn't really have an influence on the, like the coring, didn't have an influence on the thatch, did have an influence on disease on the, on the, on the table, table one here, if I can get to it without this thing blinks around all the time. On table one here is that we see the, um, dollar spot incidents. Oh wait, that's not that. That's uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. where is it at? Where, where was he referring to? Oh, several of the cultivation treatments enhanced dollar spot. Table three. Oh, they didn't have it in there anyway. The twice annual coring and the dethatching applications may have caused more severe infection. So you're beating up the turf, and there's an association with increased disease, but there was an association with decreased thatch. So why do it? This is sort of the question. In summary, the four pounds nitrogen plus one pound of K. So in this case, he's talking about a not a two to one, but a four to one in decay. Produced acceptable turf grass density, but somewhat more nitrogen may be needed for a better green color when Bermuda grass has grown on similar sandy loam soils. So better green color. Remember, the four pounds of nitrogen did result in acceptable color. But if you wanted to maximize it back then, you needed to apply more. We're not in that mindset today. That was acceptable. The four pounds of nitrogen provided acceptable color and acceptable density, and the one pound of K was all that was needed, not more. Neither nitrogen nor potassium influenced thatch development, but adequate nitrogen did reduce dollar spot severity. Core aeration and vertical mowing caused loss of stand density and did not result in any thatch reduction except for vertical mowing twice per year which decreased thatch by 8%. So here, here's a critical sentence, and we're coming on the last two or three sentences here, so bear with me here, because mm -hmm. this is important relative to other areas of turf grass management. <clears throat> He's talking about core aeration vertical mowing. Since these practices are often offered as add-on services by ground maintenance operations, care should be exercised to use these only when a specific problem warrants, warrants it. So to translate that to today in my language is don't do it unless you have a good reason. That's what he wrote, highlighted in red. Because there are other disadvantages that can come with it. And we're not really measuring much consistent benefit to doing it. Top dressing once per year provided excellent thatch control of 44 to 66% with minor influences on shoot density. Interactions between fertility treatments and mechanical treatments were not observed. Thus, higher nitrogen or potassium did not reduce the injurious effects of coring and verticutting or hasten recovery from these treatments. So what he's saying is applying a lot of nitrogen to re help recover in this case didn't help. Doing those practices caused a problem, did not result in a benefit except for the top dressing and, and the double of verticutting. Those resulted in a benefit of the, in reduction of thatch. Everything else didn't. And applying nitrogen didn't help recover from that. And potassium didn't help recover from that. So in the short and skinny of this whole paper is, what he's saying is, unless there's a problem, don't go try to fix it. 
because you might be the source of a of the problem. You may be causing more problems. It's the same as the King, the Mice, and the Cheese book. Go read it. You know, you try to solve a problem, and you're going to generate a bigger problem. Okay. Meanwhile, the, the solution to the first problem wasn't a valid solution. You, you needed to find something that would actually, you know, result in a reduction or result in whatever desired outcome that you want. And in the, in the world of thatch, it's not that consistent to where we can say, do this and that's going to happen. If, you, if, if there was something so consistent in the literature and we could say, do this, and you're pretty, we're almost certain it's going to happen, and there was a detrimental effect to it, then we could, we could work with that. We could say, okay, there is going to, this is going to happen. You're going to see reduction in quality. You're going to see reduction in density. That's going to happen. But, you, but it's worth it because we know this is, we're pretty confident that the benefit is going to, to occur. But in the world of thatch, we're not that confident the benefit's going to occur. Sometimes top dressing helps. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, or ver, sometimes this one showed core aerification didn't help at all. But other papers will show that it does. Okay, so keep that in mind if, you're, if you have thatch problems. There, is, uh, there are solutions to it. But it's only when you have a thatch problem. You know, if the source or the cause of what you're seeing is thatch, then there's a much greater chance that, you know, top dressing or vertical mowing or even core airifying could be the solution, could help. But if, but if you've done a diagnosis of the, of the problem and it's not thatch, then going out to solve that problem is probably going to create more problems and not address the actual problem. Okay, so I like this sentence. When I'll, I'll read it again. Since these practices are often offered at add-on services by ground maintenance operations, care should be exercised to use these only when a specific problem warrants it. And the same could be said for all the nutrients. Only apply potassium when, when you have a good reason. <laughs> only apply phosphorus when you have a good reason. Only apply iron when you have a good reason. Right? PGRs. You can say the same thing on every management practice, essentially, in turf grass. Only do X when you have a good reason. And a good reason is one that is supported by evidence, hopefully published in the referee literature. Okay? That's all I got for today. I'm still putting out clips of the previous streams. I'll be putting those out periodically. I put one out earlier today. Actually, just before the stream, I opened one up. I have another one for tomorrow where I'm pulling out like 10, 15 minute little clips so you guys can more easily find the content that you might be looking for. Um, so look forward to that. I'll keep that up as long as I can, which I don't know when that'll be, but I'll keep that up as long as I'm interested in doing it, I guess. Tomorrow night, I'll see you guys tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. I'll, I'll just say this, bear with me a little bit in the, in the speaker for tomorrow night because neither one of us are 100% sure what, what we're doing here. We're trying to, I mean, when it comes to the technology. So if we're a little bit late, we're a little bit late. Uh, but uh, we'll do our best to be on at 9 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow night. And, and I look forward to speaking with him and, and seeing you all there. I think you'll have a good time. Um, I, I, I hope I don't screw it up. So. Um, for those in the chat, oh, thanks, thanks, Brady, for helping everything goes well in my meeting today. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, I think it will. So, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Have a good day.